Hey guys, I got it here a little bit before my friend Nick and uh, I took a quick peek in the house. Man, this is a really interesting new build. We do, we do things very differently in Texas uh, than these guys do down here in Boston. And there he is right there, Nick Schiffer the man, pulling up in his big diesel. Nick, what's up, buddy? What's up, Matt? Good to see you, man. You too, man. It's a good looking house, dude. Thanks, dude. I like it, I like it. It's pretty interesting, right? It's very interesting. Totally different than what we do uh, down in Texas, with some exceptions. Yeah, well, we have a basement. That's uh... You have a basement and you have a frost line, yeah. which I don't have in Texas. Uh, first thing I noticed, obviously, is some zip R sheathing. Tell yeah. me about that. So we actually, there's a couple of reasons we wanted to go with it. Obviously, the benefit you know, of the product itself, but we were also looking to increase our insulation and our, our, our thermal break as much as we could in the construction of the home. Yep. Full disclosure, this is my first new construction home. Hey, um, how about that? Yeah, so I've alluded to that a couple of times, but this is, I, I, I like to be aggressive with what we do, and everyone that's been involved with this project thus far has, has said that I've, uh, I've taken that role pretty seriously of being <laughs> aggressive. But right. the, the Zip R, it, it's been a great, it's been a great learning experience, I would say. Yeah. Um, Cause there's a lot of tricks, tricks and tips, you know, with inst the install of this stuff. Yeah. And where'd you learn those trips, tricks and tips? We actually met, I actually met with uh, the guys with Huber mm -hmm. um, and walked through kind of the, the general, you know, basically what they, they outline in their installation manual. Right. right, right. Um, from there, you know, I saw not faults, but areas that for an improvement yep. um, like this here. So we have, you know, we have basically an inch and a half of foam. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So let's our, see if we can show that on the side here. Right here. So overall, we got two inches. Okay. So you haven't trimmed this one yet, obviously. In the we have not. Channel. Correct. So this is R9, right? Correct. Uh, and this is poly ISO. So you get an inch and a half of poly ISO, then it's bonded to half inch shear uh, or sheathing, basically. Right. And then, so when we came down to our foundation, the first thing we, you know, obviously we're dealing with open poly ISO. Underneath. Right. So I actually uh, reached out to Steve Basic, the arch um, a friend of mine who, who's an architect. Yeah, we were just at Steve's jobs yesterday. So he, he had mentioned this detail with, you know, basically we're, we had a two by two piece of pressure treated lumber um, that is adhered uh, to our sill. Uh -huh. And what we'll do is we'll take the Huber liquid flash, liquid flash that seam up and around and then we'll tape back down onto that. Nice. So we can seal right from our sheathing right to our foundation wall. Yeah, and then you get a perfect air seal there. Exactly. Love it. Um, Let's go inside and have a look. Yeah. What were you gonna say, I'm sorry? No, so, you know, other areas like around the doors and the windows, um, you know, one thing we noticed was the installation when you're hand nailing versus uh, shooting with a gun. Oh, on the zip bar. Yeah, so one thing that, you know, right off the bat, one you know, Basically, what we're, when we were learning is when we were setting the depth of our nail on our gun. So a couple of them would stick proud. You take a hammer, you whack it, and that nail would actually compress that poly iso, and now you get a wave in your panel. Oh, so we were like, "All right, hold up. Like we need to really think this through. Let's set our gun and make sure our gun is setting the nails." Yeah. Um, but doing that, let's we'll actually run over to uh, this doorway here. Okay. You can see. Right here, so here's our two by six wall, yep. and this is where your your poly iso would be. Mm -hmm. We've actually cut back an inch and a half and replaced that very end with a solid block. And so when we install uh, our our windows, and up here you can see that poly iso right there at that head. Exactly. Right? So we'll tape all this, but when we install our doors and our doors and windows, we have a solid nailing surface. So when we're driving that nail by hand, we're not compressing that. Yep. Thus, our windows getting all out of. Oh, yeah, it makes sense for your window flanges and door flanges and that sort of thing. Exactly. Boy, these floors feel good. What do we got here? So, Advantech inch and an eighth. We sound, um, we sound like we're on a Huber commercial here. But. I know. <laughs> um, this, was, this was actually something that early on, before we, we decided to build a new construction home, is that I, I like the idea. And a lot of people are, are you know, alluding that it's overkill. But for me, you know, I've been in so many homes where you walk and you actually feel that bounce. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That is something I wanted to make sure we, we, we stayed away from. So this is inch and one eighth thick Advan Huber Advantech. Correct. Uh, over what we're seeing here, right? So eye joists, those yes. are Weyerhaeuser eye joists. Yes. On 16 inch centers. Right. And so, how does that compare to what more quote unquote standard construction is here in so, kind of Boston area. I mean, generally speaking, 16 inch on center is pretty pretty standard. Mm -hmm. um, when we upped our inch and an eighth, we 
we were able to actually spread our, you know, our joy space into 24. Uh, so we actually talked to the guys over at Warehouser and, and Riverhead uh, Building Supply about that and ran the calcs on it. And we decided to stay with the 16 because it's kind of in the middle, not 12, not 24, that 16 right in the middle. Um, and we were able to gain a luxury floor rating from Warehouser with that system. Yeah. So it may, makes for a very stiff floor. Yeah, um, the benefit sure. to going 24, we would have had more room for mechanicals. Um, something that we could have got into maybe the advanced framing that you, you guys have chatted about. Yeah, yeah. Um, sure. It was my first build. I figured we'd stick a little bit more traditional with the this, 16. I mean, set. this for your first build, man, this is some tight framing. Your framer did a really nice job here. I'm also yeah. noticing you've got a couple details that are different than most jobs. I'm assuming that uh, not everybody in your marketplace is using LSLs, right? We're I'm assuming in the kitchen here. That's correct. Uh, so we're building, um, in our shop, we're building a traditional inset kitchen mm -hmm. so uh one inch doors one inch face frames you know three thirty seconds reveals between those inset uh flush inset doors yeah so the doors are flush and inset back there's no face frame and then uh, well it's a face frame but the doors the door. are flush with the face correct frame. Yeah, yeah so yeah. no overlay so yeah. the with installing those kitchens the biggest downfall is the adjustment and making sure you're installing on a planar surface yeah so we decided that the important walls in this home where you know maybe we have tile or you know cabinetry in this this um, circumstance we were going to up you know up the game there yep. um they're roughly three times the cost as, as a regular stud yeah but for a few hundred dollars you know on this wall it's worth it you get a really really flat wall i don't think the camera can kind of sight down this wall plane it might but man if your eyes could sight down this wall plane you would see that that is just one absolutely straight beautiful wall I mean, it's almost like using steel studs, right? Because right? you're but super. You're, and it's way more stiff. Way so more one stiff. thing you're, you're also going to notice is we got half of plywood here. Yep. And we got blocked on our seams. Mm -hmm. So this is a sheer wall. Okay, yeah, there you go. So where you're standing, if you look up, you get your steel. We actually mm -hmm. removed a sheer wall here. Um, the original layout kind of dictated that that was going to be our dining room. Got we it. decided to go for a more modern, open concept here and have the, the luxury of kind of situating our kitchen, living room, dining room into a cohesive space. That makes sense, that makes sense. Tell me about uh, insulation on this house. What are you doing for insulation? So you've got R9 uh, exterior sheathing already. Correct. So you've got R9 on these walls and you can see that, that light gray right there in the back side is uh, the inside of the poly ISO from that Correct. Huber Zip R. So right, then, so we got a, a standard two by six, and I say standard for our area, uh, two by six construction. That's what we're typically using yep. to gain our the, the R value mm -hmm. requirements. Um, two by six wall, and we're actually gonna flash these walls with an inch of closed cell. Okay. Um, that gains us our air sealing detail, yeah. gains us you know our, an, an additional R7. Nine plus then, seven. Right. So up to R16 before we even get to the rest of the cavity. And then we're adding the um, rock wall. So we'll bat Beautiful. the rock wall. And we'll give ourselves about an inch air gap, so any overspray on that closed cell or you know the air gap in general is just a good detail. You have to be careful on a flashing bat when you're using a rock wool bat. I found uh, not to not to jump into that cavity too much. I did a video on that not too long ago. Right, because then you're compressing that rock wool, yeah. or you know it's not being installed correctly, or yeah. you're, you're you're carving. What you don't want to do. Right. And then your roof line, you've got uh, looks like some some uh, two by eight maybe. Two by ten. Two by tens on 12 inch centers here? No, they're 16. Those are 16s, okay, yeah. sorry. That's okay. Uh, yeah, so the roof itself will be off roof, meaning that we're gonna do a full closed cell installation on that roof. Got it. Um, we, we, there was consideration on doing exterior insulation. Um, we actually ran some calcs on the overall performance of the home. Um, with the window details, HVAC, we decided that for what we would gain, the cost wouldn't the cost doesn't you know imply that we should go that route yep uh so we stuck with the closed cell yeah. on the entire roof makes sense hey nick tell me about all the strapping we're seeing it seems like a boston detail that i don't see in the south at all so it's a detail that i've done my whole career i've always seen in the homes that we build and remodel around here um i can't honestly answer why we do it <laughs> it's just standard practice yeah um i do know i mean it's it adds that bridging between the joists. We're not, you know, required to have the blocking, but really the root of it. I mean, I think it goes along with that blue board and plaster. It's, you know, that's just what we're used to building around, uh, building with around yeah. here. And hey, well, I'll tell you on this, on this beam, for instance, it's sure giving you a, a huge benefit here. Cause now look, we can, uh, we can kind of, hopefully you can see it in the camera. We can flush out 
the drywall across there right. and not have to worry about it when you get that beam that's a little deeper right. than our standard eye joist uh, one, depth. One thing I do notice in a lot of the older homes that we work in is that you'll see that rough sawn timber that they'll frame the house with and then they'll have that strapping and that strapping is really allowing them to detail that ceiling flat. Yeah. So we can come in, they can come in and they can adjust that, that ceiling. It's dead flat. They're not relying on those joists to be perfect. Yeah. In this case, we have engineered eye joists. It's not, it's not necessarily the case, but to your benefit, I mean, to your point, you know, things as hangers and steel beams, you know, we're able to, to feather down rather than hogging out the back of blue board or drywall. Yeah. You know, uh, in being here for five minutes, Nick, already, I can tell you, you have an impressive framer. And he's doing here's, a great job. Here's, here's a quick example. Uh, he's got a couple of uh, tie down straps here, which are tying down first floor walls to second floor walls. I'm sure the engineers spec these. He's got another one over here. But look at this. Look what his framer did right here. Let's see if I can, if you can see it. See what's happening there? That framer uh, basically did a little chisel job to make sure that that strap wasn't proud. 99% of the houses, that strap goes on on the surface, and then it's the drywall's got the drywaller or the builder later who has to try and figure out how to make that flat. Yeah, and more times than not, it's gonna be a hump in that wall. And we're in a two-story staircase right here. Yep. Which, and we got windows, three windows in the stairwell. Yeah, let's and walk up. I wanna see the upstairs real quick too. The light is gonna flood that wall. Yeah, tell me what you guys do with stairs. So these are these are sub treads that are coming off later. I'm assuming, right? That's correct. Yeah. So the, we'll just have a sub tread, and then from here we'll actually block. The details on this one are probably just going to be. I'm sorry, are going to be a walnut tread. So we're going to be doing a walnut hardwood throughout. Uh, so these will be a three quarter inch walnut tread. And will you glue that tread right to the uh, stringers? It will. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and will your carpenters build those? Yeah, we'll build them. We'll we'll pre manufacture them in the shop. Nice. Um, and we'll. What we'll do is we'll install them as blind as we can, meaning we'll we'll a lot of times we'll build pocket screws on these stringers. Really? On site, yeah. Uh, and screw from below or Whoa. add blocking if necessary. But it's usually a screw and glue method. So will you install those prior to, to uh, blue board below or no? Yes. Oh wow. Now that's if a, we can. Now that's a tip I've never seen before. Uh, um, and the this other is this is when you get a finished carpenter or woodworker <laughs> building a new home. Walnut treads pocket screwed and glued all fastened below not wood plugged uh or face nailed like most builders are right doing. the other and one other way is we work from one you know either top uh the bottom up mm -hmm. and we can actually work if there is blue board on there we can work from inside that cavity mm -hmm. and usually we end up plugging the very top one okay yeah that makes sense like that man that's smart i love it i'll tell you nick uh i started my career in um production building. Uh, and I'd done some remodeling um, work in junior high and high school, mainly for a church ministry. But uh, I'd never built any new uh, or remodel until I graduated. And uh, I started with a production builder out of school, worked for them for many years, thought I was building an amazing house when in reality, I was building not very good houses. Uh, whereas you start your career many years, you're what, four or five years in business now doing uh, old houses, remodeling. We shot a video at your other 1930s house. Right. I think you, in that remodeling career, has tur are turning into uh, a phenomenal general contractor that has that remodeling experience. So when you build new, you go, hey, here's the problems I found with water intrusion, with lack of insulation, with termite damage, with you know all those things you find in those old remodels. And now you come to a new house, and man, Nick's crushing it. Yeah, I, th I mean, I, and I appreciate that. I think that really does speak true to starting and remodeling mm -hmm. is that you know with any any industry right you learn from mistakes yeah no matter what yeah so having the ability to learn from other people's mistakes yep. whether you know we tear apart our house for issues or mm -hmm. we renovate a home and and see the way they did it and see the corrections they made yeah or you know we're ripping apart an, an issue yep you know learn taking you know the education from you know basically history yeah. of, you know, remodeling. I mean, learning just like we were at that other job, learning from those older builders. Right. Pretty cool. Tell me about uh, window installs. So you've got Zip R. We do. Uh, you've got some exposed uh, material here. Yes. What do you do for waterproofing and installing windows? So this is going to be a multi-step process. Um, first step is we are going to take our, um, a piece of clapboard actually. 
Um, so we'll just use like a pine clapboard okay. and we'll, you'll have that half inch side towards the back and that's going to create a pitch. So your, your sill is framed flat and then you'll pitch it later. Yeah. So that. our sill, you know, typically you're going to give your, the, the frame a rough openings. We're doing rough opening with our sill height dropped an extra half inch. Ah, gotcha. So there's that extra half inch. We put our piece of clapboard here, adhere it down and we'll take our, our zip, um, stretch tape uh -huh. and we'll stretch tape down and on, you know, creating our, our sill pan. Your sill pan that's sloped. I love that's it. sloped. Yep. And then from there we want to get, make sure that we're, we're in, encapsulating the foam here yep. so we'll actually run our tape close up all the foam close up all the foam yeah, all the way it. around yep. we'll install our window we'll use the liquid flash behind our flange install our window and then tape the head uh the jams in the head love it man good job oh what is that shiny stuff i'm seeing there so we are what are we seeing this is like half copper half zip sheathing up here all right so what are we looking at nick a coordination uh the debacle maybe yeah <laughs> so we installed the copper roof ahead of the roof the, the asphalt roof yep uh it makes for you know carefulness on the site uh what you're looking at is we actually took a couple extra sheets of the zip r and our fins are actually 15 on center so we took hogged out the back of that foam every 15 inches and dropped this panel on to protect the copper while we're shingling the roof above. Now that is smart. Now that also allows the shingle guys to come in, run their flashing, run their ice water right down to the top of the copper and their shingle and they're done. Roof is 100%. And that's beautiful. Look at that. What a what a cool detail I've never seen before. So here's his copper. It's taped to the uh, to the shear wall here, which is his waterproofing. He's protected it in the meantime with that zip sheathing, and this is just temporary. Like he's got a, some straps from his lumber holding that on. But look at that copper job, soldered in the corners, all fully taped and integrated. And then when he runs his siding down here, everything will be shingled. And what is this? Uh, what's this soffit and uh, fascia material I'm seeing here? So that's the uh, Tapco Boral. Um, so that's that. It's basically a synthetic material. Um, we've used, we've used PVC in the past. Mm -hmm. We just find this to work the workability. Once it's installed, it's, it's easier for us. Um, everything gets painted. Um, the nice thing is you can glue and sand it in place. Uh, it acts much like wood. Um, but it's been a huge benefit to our projects. It's, it, it really allows us to get the details that we're looking for. That's awesome, man. Hey, um, let's, Let's run down to the basement. So tell me about your foundation design. You've got these walls here, which are below grade all the way, it looks like. And then we're in a walkout situation. And I'm noticing that you've got some insulation board yep. sticking up as we probably are getting close to coming out of grade. What's right. going on with that? So here's our, our footing. This is our, our footing for the the nine foot wall to the left here. Mm -hmm. Our, we actually have a footing drop here that drops us another four feet below. This ah, elevation. So interesting. This, basically our footing is another four foot because here in Mass we have a 48 inch frost line. Got we have it. to be that, that far below grade in order to meet code. So the stem wall back here in the back of the house is that deep as well, is that right? Right, so we're actually, if you're, this is going to be the same overall height as that. It's just basically taking those forms and dropping them down. Oh, interesting. Uh, so that runs into the corner, and then we, and then we're, then we're here. This right here, it actually looks like this is our footing with a, a, a small six-inch wall. This is actually our wall. Got so it. we shrunk down from a ten-inch wall to that five and a half to catch this, and then we have a small shelf here, which will allow us to pour our slab up against. And then you got two inches of rigid foam right two here. Two inches of rigid foam, and that's basically because we are walkout that ground's gonna get cold and we don't want that cold transferring the wall through the wall into this. That's right. And then later you're gonna pour this basement slab, right? Correct. And and how how does that work? So that basement slab is going to be also insulated. Ah, what is this? So we're using the Vega panels. Um, this is a radiant system. Whoa, show so, me how that works. That looks cool. So we have an R10 foam, okay, um, and it also has a vapor barrier built onto it. So this is EPS foam. It's probably ground contact yes. uh, related because they do make some EPS that is not right. Uh, and uh, and this one probably has a higher pound per square foot exactly. uh, rating as well. So this is actually designed to be. It's all in, it it interlocks. Oh, it interlocks. How cool is that? And technically, you know, per their per their specs, we actually don't have to install a vapor barrier. 
Uh, in this case, we're going to kind of do the belt and suspenders, you know, typical to our approach, mm -hmm. um, and add, you know, the stega mat as well. Yeah. Um, but and, and this interlocks in both directions, right? It, it does. Like so you can like see the long interlock on both sides. Right. Man, that's really cool. So it makes it makes installation a lot easier. A lot of times you're seeing the wire mesh dropped on the floor, and then you're running radiant, and you're actually zip tying or or uh, cable tying yeah. your radiant tubes. This makes it much snap, easier. Snap that in for me. Show me how that works. So this is a Viega PEX that's going to run with a combi boiler or something. Exactly. So we have this in the basement here, mm -hmm. and as well as the garage. Okay. Two different zones. But it's real. I mean, super easy. It's it's going to snap real quick. Oh man, that's awesome. So you're gonna you, basically you're gonna get this installed, and you're gonna do a rough idea of how this stuff lays out to make sure that you know down here it's gonna be one zone. But if you're doing multiple zones, you're gonna want to map that out ahead of time. That's cool. And so that's what all these boxes are right here. This is where the the coil of uh, my what my yeah. So the PEX was in there, and then these bags have the dimple mat basically it's a dimple with an insulation and a vapor barrier exactly. all locking together and then there's all those panels and our concrete will get poured right on top of that man that's really cool nick cool. gotta tell you man this is an impressive new build you're doing a really nice job nick appreciate that it's gonna be fun to uh to follow this one guys if you don't know nick or you're not familiar with him um nick and i became friends through instagram uh, and we've gotten together every time I get to Boston and we see each other at IVS. He has an incredible podcast with a couple other builders called the Modern Craftsman Podcast. You should absolutely get on iTunes and start following him there. I'll put a link in the description below. Uh, you should definitely be following him on his Instagram feed. If you don't have Instagram, get it. Uh, I'm active on it, but he's super active on it. And he's got some, the way I started, I think the way I found him was just incredible, beautiful craftsmanship and woodwork. He's a cabinet maker, basically a furniture quality products. He's making it in a shop, putting it in his builds. And he's really gained a reputation in, in um, Boston in a short amount of time through fantastic use of social media, similar to me when I started my business 13 years ago, except I was using YouTube. And he also has a great YouTube channel. So you should definitely be following him. What's, what are you calling this build if they're following you on social media? This is Lake Drive Custom. Lake Drive Custom. Yeah, so hashtag Lake Drive Custom. And if you're in the Boston market and you're watching this, you're an interior designer, an architect, you should get to know this guy. He is, he's an up and comer who's going to be, he's already grown a bunch since I've, I've known him. You should be talking to him about your, your good, your good clients, your good builds. Don't, don't send him your bad clients. <laughs> don't send him your builds with a We've low budget. Uh, this guy does it right. He charges for it like I do, but he's, he's a good builder. And it was really fun to walk this with you, Nick. Appreciate yeah. you coming out. Totally. Follow Nick on uh, all those social media sources. Uh, hit that subscribe button if you're not a current subscriber. We publish new content every Tuesday and every Friday. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on The Build Show.